Hello, friend. I'm so excited that you're here today. Today, we're going to be talking with Dave Chesson from the Kindlepreneur. And I'm so excited because we're going to talk about keywords and we're going to talk about categories and also his program, uh, Rocket, and also Atticus. So I'm super excited about this interview. Let's just hop right into the interview. Could you tell us a little bit about yourself? Sure. Well, um, so I started writing years ago back when I was um a lieutenant in the navy and i was stationed on the other side of the world and my wife and i were trying to figure out a way to get me out of the military um and be home as a family and so being on the other side of the world writing and self-publishing books on kdp sounded like a really good idea because for me i could write you know when i can i even wrote my first book on a south korean warship uh and then when you send it over to amazon they take care of all the logistics. They yep. take care of sending the file, collecting the money, paying you, et cetera. And so I was like, this is awesome. From there, I started chronicling all about what I learned about the market. I really studied Amazon. I wanted to know why Amazon would choose to show one book over another. And why is it that, you know, what can I do to get them to show my book more often? And so that's really where my big website, Kindlepreneur, started, was talking and teaching about all the things I learned as I went through. Um, a couple of years later, I was able to build a software that I had always wanted myself um, called Publisher Rocket that helps authors to better understand uh, what's going on in the market, find the right keywords, the kind of keywords that actually help uh, choose the right categories, know what money other books are making and that sort of thing. And then <clears throat> just recently, because I had a phenomenal uh, software team and really learned software, I wanted to tackle another problem that I ran into as an author, which was, you know, writing and formatting a book. And, mm -hmm. you know, there's great formatting software out there called Vellum, but it only works for Mac users. Um, and on top of that too, there was, authors were using things like Scrivener and then exporting to Word, and emailing back and forth with an editor and then uploading it to a software. I wanted to create something where an author could plan, write, collaborate, and format all in one and make it easy. And so that was my latest project, Atticus.io. Yay. Yes. Which by the way, after 20, 20, um, 20 books, I actually got Atticus and it helped me upload like my, I did my first, I'm, I'm doing a serial right now. So I did my first episode in there and I'm just like, this works perfect. Like oh, super before cool. I was like, struggling with like you know photoshop and in mm. illustrator and um indesign and it's just like oh my gosh wasting almost a whole week with formatting so you saved me some time <laughs> oh super cool <laughs> yes so happy about that so i'm enjoying it and i'm excited too about like what's going to be coming in the future with atticus and i'd like to get into that a little bit a little bit later too but um that's so cool that you started out writing out on the ship and stuff and, and submitted your story. And like, that's where you started. I love that. Yeah, it was, it really proves that you can write from anywhere. We were actually right. patrolling some very dangerous waters when I was writing that first book. Wow. And, and uh, uh, you know, there's, there's a picture of me. I was in my Navy camos and I had my sea bag and in the bag was the laptop that I was writing my <laughs> first book. And so it's always that, you know, I was literally getting, off a helicopter, a Korean helicopter onto okay. a Korean destroyer. Um, so yeah, it was, it was fun times. Oh my goodness. Yeah. Well, and thank you for your service as well. That's just oh, awesome. That was my honor. I enjoyed yeah. it. That's awesome. Cool. Okay. And I always love to ask this question because it's always interesting to find out what people like to read. What are five of your favorite books that you've ever read? Oh boy. Um, are we talking <laughs> fiction or nonfiction or both? It, it can be both. It can be either or. I know it's a hard question because there's a lot of books out there, but. Well, um, a book I just read recently that I've just been shouting its name uh, out every time I can talk to somebody is Red Rising uh, okay. by I think Pierce Brown is the name of the author. Um, I think it's my new favorite science fiction book of cool. all time. And my wife doesn't like sci-fi and she's not an adventure, but she decided to read it and she's going to crush out the entire series now. So, oh, go to so she likes it, it. Oh, it's so good. Good. Um, that'd be my number one. Number two. Uh, I like old man's war by, mm -hmm. um, John Scalzi. I like Ender's game by Orson Scott card for nonfiction. I'm going to throw in, um, I'm going to say, uh, good to great okay. is a great one. And my favorite biography would probably be Shoe Dogs 
uh, oh, about the story okay. of Nike. So there you go. There's a smattering that I can come up with real quick. Yeah, no, that's perfect. That's great. Uh, I've read a couple of them, but I haven't read all of them. So I'm going to have to I'm gonna have to check out those other ones. Thank you. Because of course, I don't have enough books. I need more. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Hey, right. no author or writer ever has enough books. Right, right. Exactly. So true. Perfect. Okay, so um, so when it comes to just beginning your keyword research and everything, like let's say a first time author is going to start keyword researching, what are some things that you would recommend they start doing that would help them place their book in the correct place so that people can find them? Well, when you start your keyword research, I recommend breaking out a sheet of paper and starting to come up with kind of ideas or thought processes. And if you're writing a fiction book, uh, you know, there's different kinds of keywords you should be thinking about. And if you're writing a nonfiction book, there's different keywords you think about, yeah. you know, for nonfiction, you should look at how to describe the pain point, mm -hmm. how to describe the result that somebody wants, and how do you describe the, the person themselves, the market, mm -hmm. you know? So like um, the pain point might be, I feel fat. Yep. The result is I want to lose weight or fit mm -hmm. into a bathing suit. Yeah. Um, the, the demographic or the person that you're writing for might be like a single mom, or it might be, uh, you know, a busybody, you know, somebody who works a nine to five job, somebody who has way too many kids, you know, not way too many kids, but so <laughs> many kids that they don't have time for themselves. Right. Like, how do you describe the person? Uh, you can also even throw in another category of what I call exciters and exciters are words that, you know, excite the problem or excite the result or excite, you know. Uh, and this could be like, learn fast, uh, five steps to, you know, um, easy, like these, you can add it to your uh, result, you know, oh, lose weight yeah. easily, lose weight on your time, lose weight Perfect. fast, you know. Um, and so those are the kinds of keywords that really build out the nonfiction. With fiction, on the other hand, it's like, Fiction isn't about problems or solutions. What fiction is, is about describing the story. Mm. Um, and so this is where you talk about like your character roles, your time, uh, time periods and settings, um, the agitation or the, what I call the starter to the story, like what mm. kicks it off. Um, and then my favorite is the tone of the genre. And what I mean by that is, you know, sometimes I'll ask a author, well, what's your, uh, you know, what do you write? And they're like, oh, I'm a romance writer. I'm like, what kind of romance? Well, I write um, contemporary, you know, and then they kind of fumble through it. Well, yep. let me tell you, when you know what the tone is, when you, how you describe it, it's incredible. Because yep. in romance alone, you can go from wholesome Christian yeah. to, I don't know, bondage or yeah. whatever. And there's <laughs> right a, a whole right. huge amount of words in between to describe the level of it. Same yeah. thing with thriller. You can go from, ooh, you know, thriller to blood gore fest, yeah. you know, almost bordering on horror. Yeah. How do you describe that tone? And these are the ways that shoppers are looking mm. for their works. And so I tell authors, start with a pen and paper and start ideating based off of those things. Yeah. Then start grouping them together and seeing what really fits. Now, using a program like Publisher Rocket, you can validate those ideas and you can even create more ideas and find out ones that actually will help instead of just kind of guessing. Right, right. And then so when people come up with those um, keywords, um, do you also recommend like um, searching in the search bar uh, in Amazon kind of to see what people are searching and then, you know, in putting those in your keyword or, you know, if you have Rocket, I like, by the way, I love Rocket. <coughs> it's Absolutely. really been helpful. Um, so you can look those up and then input those into the keyword um, thing inside of Rocket and yeah. see how they perform. Yeah, without Rocket, what you can do is you can take those ideas and put it through the search bar and you can start kind of typing in and seeing what Rocket or what Amazon will show you in the search bar. Mm -hmm. And you can start creating this long list of, of you know, uh, potential ideas and keywords. Mm -hmm. And you can go through that giant list and you can start to look at the books that show up for it and see how much money they're making and then kind of develop an average. Um, and then the final thing you can do is start looking at the competition and like how competitive are the books that are showing up for it? That's mm -hmm. kind of the manual way of doing it. With Rocket, on the other hand, it does all of that like instantaneously right. for you. 
you can see, you know, you type in your initial phrase and it creates a whole giant list of all the other things Amazon has seen that's close to that phrase. Then it will also tell you uh, how many searches per month people are making for that phrase, something you can't do manually. It will tell you the average amount of money that books are making. It will tell you the uh, competition score, like how competitive is it from one to a hundred with one being super easy and hundred being ridiculously hard. It even gives color coordination on the searches and the competition to tell you if it's a good idea or not. Mm -hmm. And so it okay. makes choosing those words and finding those words uh, very effective and efficient. Yeah, that's awesome. And then would you say that there is a sweet spot for, okay, for people that have Rocket, is there a sweet spot um, for those monthly searches? Or I know that um, sometimes, and plus when they're, you know, if they're searched a lot, they show up red. And if they're a good amount, I think it shows up green. What is it? I think Actually, what's really cool about our color coordinating, especially for the estimated searches, is yep. that it figures out if that phrase is one where people will buy the book for, um, yeah. and it helps okay. to use that to, to do it. So for example, um, say you look at the keyword phrase of fantasy book. Okay. okay. Yeah. There are a lot of people that type that in, but Rocket knows because we have this whole analysis database it knows that most people don't buy a book for that search because what happens is they're like, well, what's the chances that Amazon's going to show you the exact kind of fantasy book you're looking for when you type that in? And they're like, ah, oh, crikey, I'll go back and I'll <laughs> add something to what I said. Yeah. Um, you could do this for romance. You say romance book and all of a sudden the, you, you see a whole bunch of covers of men with their shirts off. You're like, oh, good, good Lord. No, no, no. And so <laughs> it will say really romance like book and then you'll add Christian wholesome. So it's romance book, Christian wholesome. And now all of a sudden you see less, you know, man boobs or whatever, and you see more, you know, like family and, you know, yeah. Mr. Nice. And, yeah. um, and then all of a sudden, you know, and the person just keeps tweaking their search. Sure. Right? So now I've got Christian wholesome. I like the prairie. So, you know, we'll call yeah. it like a Western. Oh, nope. That went cowboys. Let me change that. Let me go to prayer on the prairie, you know, or Rocket will actually start to figure out, and you may see that the phrase is something like uh, romance, Christian, wholesome on the prairie. It may have less searches than, say, romance book. Rocket will give that one a green and still show you that's a good phrase because that's very descriptive. It, it's cool. proven to make sales. And so it helps to guide you in those decisions. Instead of seeing something and be like, wow, that's, that's get searched. I should choose that. Well, that's not going to help you with your book. And so it really goes above and beyond to help make that choice easier. Wonderful. Thank you for going into that a little bit, because sometimes it can be a little tricky to know exactly what that might mean or not. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So, perfect. Okay. And then uh, what are some things that authors should keep in mind when it comes to categories? So when it comes to categories, um, a lot of authors make the mistake of believing that when you go to upload your book to Amazon, <clears throat> that uh, the pop-up box, you know, so you're uploading your book to KDP and they have mm -hmm. that pop-up box where they ask you to select your category. And they see this list and they think, oh, this is a list of all of Amazon's categories. That's actually not true. That's what, that's a list of what they call BISACs. And BISACs is like an international standard category code. Way back in the day, there used to be this problem where big publishing companies would have this book and they would be like, oh, we think this is in the category of Wiccan. And so they would send it off to all the, the, the stores and a little mom and pa shop would get the, the book and they would look at what the publishing company said and it says Wiccan. Well, we got eight, you know, um, we got eight aisles, you know, or bookshelves to, to figure out where to put this book. Um, Hey, Doris, what is Wiccan? Uh, I think that's fantasy. Okay. But it was actually religious studies. Yeah. But the big publishing company, you know, has a large list of their own. And the mom and pa shop only has like eight choices to make. And so it became the subjective opinion on where to put it. So there was so much confusion for basically the supply chain that there was an organization that came together and created a BISAC. And it's like, look, this is the list of every, no matter who you are, publisher, Amazon, Barnes and Noble, mom and pa shop. This is the standard list of categories. 
the publisher will choose one of those categories. You guys as a store need to have already figured out that this 800 BISAC codes goes on that shelf. This 200 goes on that shelf. This 1,000 goes, you know, or a giant store. This 22 go here. This 10 go there. And so it's now no longer a subjective opinion. So when the publisher selects a BISAC, the store, it automatically figures out that, oh, that goes on nonfiction or nonfiction shelf. Or it goes on our religious studies because this store has that. Or it goes on the Wiccan shelf because they have so many shelves that they actually have one on Wiccan. And so all of that, so they created this BISAC, BISAC system. And so the same thing happens when you go to Amazon and you select one of the BISACs. But here's where it's important for authors. There are 4,800 BISACs wow. um, listed. Amazon has over 11,000 mm. book cate categories. So what this means is that if you're just selecting one of those BISACs, you're doing two things. One, you're selecting from the same 4,800 that everybody else selects from, which means that other 6,000 plus is not being touched, okay? Wow. Um, mm -hmm. So most of the least competitive categories are the ones that aren't listed on the BISAC. But the other thing too, is you're leaving it up to Amazon to choose where to kind of put you. Um, so you might select a BISAC, and this is what happens to a lot of authors is they'll select two BISACs and then some, you know, they'll find out that they were put in some weird category. I didn't ask for that. <laughs> but that's what Amazon did. What, at, what authors can do is that they can, after they publish their book, they can contact Amazon. They have this form to fill out and you can request any Amazon category you want to be a part of. You can pretty much go up to 10 categories. You can change the categories. You can remove categories, et cetera. But the biggest question that comes to authors now is, okay, so where do I find these 11,000 categories? You don't, they don't have a list anywhere. Um, they, you know, and they're always changing them and adding them and deleting them, et cetera. So you can either go through and manually look up every one of them and try to figure it out and try to hunt it down and then try to communicate which exact category it is. On Rocket, one of the things we do is we got that entire list. Um, and even more importantly, we create some really easy ways to find the right categories for you. Um, and my favorite part is that we even tell you how many books that day you would need to sell in mm -hmm. order to be the bestseller for that category. You're not just looking at these 20 or 30 categories that might fit your book, but you're finding the ones that give you the best chance for bestseller, the best chance to go. be seen um, by more of the market. And so it just really takes the guesswork out and just makes it faster, makes more effective and efficient. Yeah, so much easier. <laughs> Saves you time too. <laughs> Absolutely. What are the benefits for like authors out there that, I mean, don't have Rocket that, um, maybe need a little more information about Rocket, um, what would be the benefits for them to get Rocket? I, we heard some great benefits just a little bit ago that you did talk about, about like categories and keywords and saving time. Um, but what are some other, um, what are some other benefits that authors can get or that would help them decide to purchase it? Yeah, well, another thing beyond helping to position your book for, for better sales or so, one of the things I like to use Rocket from the get-go is kind of helping me to understand how potentially successful my book will be before I write it. Uh, so if you have this idea, you can put it through Rocket and you can start to see how many people on Amazon are actively searching for your kind of thing that you're thinking about writing. Um, you can also see how much money other books are making that have kind of attacked that. You can learn a little bit about your competition. What are they doing right? What are they doing wrong? Now, mm -hmm. say, for example, you choose some crazy subject, and, you know, like, and this is actually a real example out there, um, <laughs> an, how to use an air fryer in an RV. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. Um, and interesting enough, there must have been some push or whatever, because there are people that search for it. Sure. But let's say you're you want to write about that, how to use, you know, how to cook or recipes for your air fryer in an RV. Yeah. Um, and you could go to rocket and put it in and be like, wow, okay, well, you know, there's, there's a couple of people per month typing that in. Now that doesn't mean you can't write the book that might help you to understand that if I put all this effort into creating this book, I can understand that market will, that Amazon will help to send a couple of people a month to my book. So I can expect 15, 20, $25 a month from just mm -hmm. making this book. Now, 
that helps you to make a better decision. You're not just going to guess and, you know, because, oh, I know a whole bunch of my friends that do this. Well, that's cool. And maybe there is a real collective out there, but are they going to Amazon and actively searching for this kind of thing? And so mm -hmm. now you can see that information to make that decision. And the truth be told is that you can either choose to still write it because maybe 25 bucks a month is, is awesome to you um, mm -hmm. and it's worth all that effort uh, to, to do it. Or you could also be like, okay, I need to kind of pivot. Maybe I shouldn't niche it down so much to RVs and just talk about air fryer recipes, you know, mm, yeah. and maybe I might find that there's a different market, like, you know, the busy moms, uh, you know, recipe book for air fryers. Oh, and so I have, I pivot a little bit and now I'm opening it up, opening up to a much bigger market right. with a much higher chance of, of sales success. But even if you're like, no, Dave, I really love the RV aspect. And I think there's something there for it. Then what rocket tells you is that you, you can write that book, go for it, but you cannot expect Amazon to naturally send people to you. So therefore your marketing strategy, when you release that book needs to be what I call interruptive marketing. Hmm. And that's because people aren't actively looking for what you're doing. So you need to go find those people, market to them and bring them to your product. This is where I would say Amazon ads is even more important than it was mm -hmm. if, you know, if you actually had organics or doing Facebook ads or building an email list or doing something where you're grabbing the market somewhere else and you're bringing them to what you have. Um, and sure. so I think that's a really powerful thing for authors to understand. So you can use Rocket to check your idea, see how much interest there is, understand your market maybe pivot to something much better to give you much higher, higher chance of success or to set your expectations right and develop a stronger marketing plan, understanding what the market looks like. Yeah. That's awesome. You can use it for so much. Yeah. I've really been enjoying rocket. So thank you for going into that. That's going to be helpful for some people. I think, um, how did rocket come about originally? Well, so for me, understanding all the information we talked about was really critical to my success. Right. I wasn't some Ernest Hemingway that I could sit down and write about tying my shoes and, you know, it being a bestseller. I, I just couldn't. But what I did learn was like, wow, if I understood that this many people are looking for something and they can't find it, yep. I'm a good teacher. Mm -hmm. I can create that. Or, wow, there's a surge in this kind of story. You know, that's, that's close to what I do. I, I can pivot to that a little bit and ride that wave. These are really important for me. And so when I was writing all about this on Kindlepreneur, I was doing a lot of uh, Excel sheets and trying to say, well, this is what you do. And authors don't want to deal with that. Um, <clears throat> but the other big thing was, is that there was a tool out at the time called Kindle Samurai. And I thought it was a great tool, um, but there was a couple of problems with it. And it helped to build the Excel sheet that I was talking about. But it was made um, by someone who didn't speak English as a primary language. And he's a great guy. Uh, I'm, you know, good friends with him. Um, still am to this day. And, but he wasn't able to add support. He was a programmer, not a writer. So he would make mm. a program and move on and move on. And this program was breaking. Like yeah. certain parts were breaking, but he wasn't coming back to like work on it or fix it. It oh, wasn't his okay. thing. Um, and it only worked on PC. It didn't work on Mac. So I was like, man, you know, and so what he just kept doing was he just kept making the price lower and lower because he wasn't going to fix it. So, right. so I was like, man, you know, if I could get some programmers and take this and fix all those problems mm -hmm. and make it work on both Mac and PC, and then add all these other things to it. So people don't have to use it and an Excel right. sheet, we got something awesome here. And that was basically the basis of how, and it was called KDP rocket back in the day. Now it's called publishing <laughs> rocket. Perfect. And that's how it was started. Wonderful. That's really and with um, Rocket then. Are there any new things coming with the program in the near future? Yeah. In January, we're going to be releasing Audible, but pretty yeah. soon you'll be able to see Audible sales and do okay. some Audible research and things like that. Wow. Um, and so that's coming out in January. And then in a couple of months after that, we have a historical category data. So okay. for all of those 11,000 plus categories that I discussed, you can click on one and see the sales history and the popularity of each one of those categories and see how many people have been added, you know, how many new books have been added to it. Yep. 
look for opportunities and even look for trends in the year. Uh, just so happens that, you know, um, uh, vacation romance is pretty hot, you know, in May and dips right. off at around November, you know, and so you can start to really yep. make some plans about your launch. So that's um, gonna be- okay. So then with Atticus, that cute little dog, um, can you tell us a little bit about Atticus and how it came into your life or how he came trotting into your life? <laughs> yeah. Well, I came up with the name Atticus. Um, well, actually I came up with the dog because <laughs> I keep, I, you know, it's a little inside here, but I keep trying to get my wife to let me get a dog. Um, right. And I've always wanted a Boston Terrier. So I was like, so hmm, cute. You They're know, so cute. I was like, you know, if, if I, if I got that dog, I could make that a business expense. What do you think, honey? That's a good idea, right? No. So <laughs> all, all jokes aside though, I am, I am, I'm actually hoping I get a Boston Terrier here soon. Um, yeah, but that, cool. that's our little, that's our little buddy. I chose the name Atticus though, for a couple of reasons. Number one is it's actually named after uh, Titus Atticus. Titus Atticus was one of the major publishers uh, of works way back in the Roman Empire. Um, and as a matter of Ooh. fact, he's credited for saving Cicero. He, he's the one that published letters to Cicero, but he, mm. he saved a lot of the works of Socrates, um, you know, and, and made it so that we never lost that. And because about taking that and formatting into it and publishing was a big thing. And so I was like, this is awesome, you know? Um, yeah. But the more I researched into the name, the more I realized most of the, the the Romans that had the name Atticus, or even in modern day, anything named Atticus was something of, of virtue, of yeah. philosophy, of poetry. I was like, this is the name, you know? And of oh. course you got the amazing character Atticus Finch, you know? And so I was like, I loved it. So I, I fell in love with that name and that's how we came up with it. Truth be told is, like I said, there was really two parts to it. The first thing was, is that, you know, just for formatting your book, nothing, nothing else, just formatting. Uh, there really was only one great software that that did it in such an effective and efficient manner. And that was uh, Vellum. And, oh, yeah. you know, but Vellum is 200 or what is it? 247, 249.99, I think. Yeah, it's like 250 yeah. bucks for book and ebook. Yeah. Um, and it only works on on Mac, it does not work on PC. So every PC user or Chromebook user or Linux user was either A, not able to do it, or B, would buy a Mac or pay for Mac and cloud just to be able to use it. Mm. And, you know, this was like, I do love my Macintosh computer, you know, yep. but I would hate to have to buy a PC so I could use yeah. a program. And, but that's how good it was. So I, the first thing I thought was, all right, first off, if we could take Vellum, and make that work for all computers. And there's a whole bunch of features I would like to add to make it better. Yeah. Let's do that. And let's make it more than $100 cheaper. So that's what we did. We created that formatting. It's $147 ebook and book. Um, it works on all computers. And there's a whole bunch of features that, that I've been wanting for a long time. Um, and we're just adding more to it. But truth be told is, is that this is not like Atticus isn't just a formatting software because the true pain and where I want to take this company to is that I, as I write my books, I would use the software for organizing my stuff. Then mm -hmm. I'd use the software for writing my book. And then I would have to export it out of that software and email back and forth, back and forth with my editor and have seven or eight different word files on my desktop that say final something in it final all caps final yes. this is the final final <laughs> for edited. real this time <laughs> yeah for real this time you know and so and then i would have to take that and upload it to a formatting software and for me i've just always <laughs> wanted this ability to have one software mm -hmm. where i can plan write collaborate and format mm. and control my book through the entire thing instead of having to jump and pivot and pay more and yeah. pay this subscription here and pay that subscription there and then pay for this. And, um, and so that's what we created was we created Atticus to be that. So right now you have the ability to write in Atticus and there's a lot of tools to help you with that. And then you can format in Atticus without having to export it and upload it into another yeah. program. Um, we have some more things I want to add to the writing to make it even better, uh, okay. make it, you know, like 
try to rival with even Scrivener and their capability. Awesome. Um, and then once we've got that tied down, I want to create the collaboration capability, mm -hmm. which is the glue that holds it all together. And in collaboration, imagine that you are finished writing and now you want to work with your editor. You would click a link and you would send an email to the editor that it would send that link to the, to the editor. Editor can open it up and we're designing the editor's free version okay. to look and feel like a word document. Okay. Where you can do track changes and, you know, and comments and all that. Perfect. So for the editors, it will feel like what they're used to, but there's a couple of things that we know editors want. And so we're mm -hmm. adding that to theirs to make it even more powerful for them. Oh, cool. But for you, the author though, uh, you can look at your Atticus without having to look, you know, leave it. And you can see the editor make their recommendations and you can accept, you can, you know, uh, oh, decline, nice. you can comment, you can communicate back and forth with them, you know, and then you can walk off and come back and then see what else they did and go in there. And by the time you're finished working with them, the best part is this, is that you can then secure their access to your book, mm -hmm. remove them from it and continue in your process. And again, yep. never having to leave the software. That's nice. That's really nice. Cause that's, I feel like that's a pain point with like even Scrivener. Cause I've used Scrivener for many, many years and stuff, but mm -hmm. like one Me thing too. where you have to like copy and paste it into like a word doc or a, you know, a Google doc and send that where you can't just like send something from in the, in the program. So I think that's going to be monumental. Like that's going to be awesome. Yeah. I, I like I said, I, and it's not just going to be with um, editors because our collaboration yeah. component will actually have four people that you can collaborate with. You oh, can collaborate yeah. with another writer. So yep. you and a writer can write a book together in real time. Mm -hmm. You can collaborate with an editor like we talked about. You can collaborate with a formatter. So our formatting is awesome, but maybe you want to work with a designer to, to make right. special images for each chapter. Yep. Collaborate with them. Let them handle that while you do your thing. Sure. And then you can also collaborate with your ARC or beta team, okay? Mm -hmm. And so you can send them copies that they can access, and then you can take away their access when they're done. Sure. Um, and so all these things allow you. Now, I will say that to collaborate with another writer and collaborate with another formatter, both have to have Atticus. That, okay. that's, there's just too many capabilities that we can't make it where you know, there right. can just be one. Both have to have it in order to collaborate. But with editors and beta readers or arc readers, only the author needs to have Atticus and the editors and beta readers can use it absolutely for free for their capabilities. Cool. So. Yeah, that's really cool. Man, I'm, I'm super excited about all these so things, those um, abilities to like collaborate and everything. That's going to be wonderful. Do you by any chance have an idea of when those will be or at least betaing will start coming about? For those? So the best part about it is that when we started building this software over a year ago, yep. uh, we built it with all of this in mind. So it's not cool. one of those things where we build it and then we're like, oh man, wouldn't it be nice? Like, no, we, that's yeah. what we wanted to start with. So a lot of hey. the tooling has really been done under the hood already oh, with all of this in expectation. That being said though, I, you know, just to be open and honest, and by the way, anybody wants to see what we're working on, you can go to atticus.io forward slash roadmap and mm -hmm. we make it public what feature my guys cool. are currently working on what they just finished and what they're going to be working on next. So it's all listed okay. there. Cool. Um, but when it comes to software, it's like super hard to nail down. So yeah. I'm going to speak in generality here, but for the month of December, uh, there's a bunch of things that we want to clean up on to make stronger and secure in the platform to make it so that we can then handle things like we're talking about. Sure. There's a bunch of features I want to add. We'll have a brand new previewer that's going to be like, on steroids. It's awesome. Cool. That's going to allow us to do even more. Um, that will then allow us to be able to work with pro writing aid and Grammarly. And nice. we're also going to be, we're trying to work with dragon dictate so that cool. it works easily inside of that as well. Um, so there's all that's happening this December. And then in January, um, we have a bunch of writing components that we want to add. Um, that'll be really big in there as well. I think that the team will finally start really gearing up and hitting uh, collaboration with, you know, 90% of our efforts in the beginning of February. Yay. Okay. I can't speak exactly when it will when? come because it just comes down to at that point, what kind of roadblocks do they run yeah. into? But I mean, we're not, we're not talking like you know, over half a year from now or anything sure, like that. We're sure. not even talking years. Sooner than um, later, right? Oh, way sooner. Yeah. 
I think for authors, we've gotten so accustomed to having things take forever to get. I mean, yeah. like, look at like Scrivener, right? Scrivener yeah. came out with Scrivener 3.0 for Mac. What was that? Four years ago? Yeah. And then just this year, they finally created 3.0 for PC. Right. So yeah. We're not talking years. No. Okay. Yay. That'll be exciting. Yeah. That's really good news. That's why I've got a full team of seven programmers working on that around yeah. the clock. So. Oh my gosh. Well, that is so exciting though. And I bet you're just super proud of both of these products because they work so well and you've got a lot of vision for their future and everything. So that's great. And thank you for making them. Yeah, no problem. Like I said, I, it's super fun to be an author who has programmers working for him. I right. can like literally be like, man, I, I wish I could. Hey guys, let's go do that. You know, <laughs> I was like, uh, here's the, here's the other, other thing. One of my favorite features that we came out with Yep. Uh, for the formatting alone, is that I've always wanted to be able to control where the book opens up to in a Kindle. So yes. when somebody opens my book up, right, Amazon automatically puts them on chapter one. Mm. Well, maybe I want them to go to my offer page first, yeah. you know? Um, so if I write a nonfiction and I want them to sign up for the companion course, I really would like the first page to be like, hey, go to this link to, to download the notes, you know, and blah, blah, blah. Oh, um, that's great. Or the other thing is that if I'm in KU, I'd prefer them to have to go through the prologue, you know, or these other points, you know, before they start the story. Well, if you don't have special coding for that, Amazon just starts on chapter one and everything you did before that will not be read. So uh, we found that there's coding that you can do. So we made it super easy oh, now cool. that in Atticus, you can select where you want the book to open up to anywhere and Boom. When anybody on a Kindle opens up your book, it will start right there. And wow. so it's just like, like I said, as an author, I've like been pining for this uh, yeah. for a long time. So I'm just really jazzed that, you know, I could just be like, Hey guys, can, can you guys go figure that out? Figure out how to do that. <laughs> hey, we did. Sweet. Yay. So yeah. That it's is just, it's just a lot of fun. Great. Oh my word. That is wonderful. Cool. Okay. And then let's see here. The next question here. Um, Let's see, we talked over that. Okay, and then, um, so, okay, I always like to ask this question when I do interviews, but um, how, what is the most difficult thing about being a writer or, and or working in this industry for you? Hmm. Well, have you found? I think, and this would be the advice I'd give for about 80% of the authors out there. Okay. Is that in, when it comes to marketing a book, there's like thousands of different ways to do it. Yeah. And truth be told, all thousand of them work. Like it really does. Um, you will be on Facebook and you'll see somebody talk about how I made millions with TikTok. And then you'll see another one with Pinterest and another one that says you need to be doing this. And if you're not doing that, you know, and so what can end up happening for, for authors is you feel like you got to do it all. Mm -hmm. um, or you're like, oh, okay, I failed in all these other things or these other things didn't work. This might be the key. And so what an author will end up doing is one of two things. They either A, dabble in everything and they spin their wheels and they work super hard, but they get nowhere because they're just dabbling, okay? Mm -hmm. Or B, they try something. They don't see immediate success, so they pivot. And then they try something else and then pivot and pivot oh. and pivot and they pivot in circles. But both of those just get your wheels spinning and make you go in circles and you don't see a very good ROI on your time. So my biggest recommendation to authors is, especially when you're starting, choose three or four marketing tactics and stick to them. Okay. Stick to them because when you master those tactics, okay, and treat it like a skill, your writing career will benefit so much more on being really good at a certain things instead of trying to do everything. Right. And I would say maybe for the first book, you worked super hard on three. So then on the second book, you add a new one. Now you have four. Then the next book, you add a new one. Now you have five. And all of a sudden, you're going to really incrementally build your capability and okay. eat the success and the reach of each book. And I think that makes a much better author as a whole than it is to dabble or pivots <laughs> and all yeah. the things that are out there. Exactly. Oh my gosh. That's really good advice. Thank you for sharing that. That's yeah, really you bet. It's, it's one of those things that I wish somebody had told me when I first started. Right. So I'm like, every time I'm on a podcast or so, I'm like, that's my number one recommendation. <laughs> it would have saved me so many blood, sweat, and tears. 
Perfect. Okay. And then, so what would you say is the most precious thing that you love about this industry slash your job writing? What do you love about it? I, I, I will have to say, so there's a lot of things to love about it. That's for sure. Yeah. But I love reading books and there are certain authors out there that I've just been like, like, I just love the author, yeah. you know, like I, and um, being in this industry, I've not only been able to work with a lot of those authors, um, sit side by side with them cool. um, and help. Um, like, for example, Orson Scott Card, one of my favorites that I listed, yeah. I've been able to work with him. And oh, like, cool. you know, when I was in fourth grade, I found Ender's Game. And I think I, I credit him as for my love of science fiction. If you know so me, cool. I'm a total sci-fi nerd. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I'm even the one that promised that, you know, uh, if I can work it, that my speech in 20 books, Vegas next year yep. happens to be on, on cosplay day, I'm going up as a stormtrooper. Hey, so there when you I go. say nerd, it. it's nerd right here. Um, it's good. It's good. That's right. That's right. So um, <laughs> just being able to, to be in an industry that I just love the product of. Yeah. Um, you know, all of my books and audio books that I buy get to be business expenses. And yeah. Um, oh, goodness. Yes. Yeah. It's just, I don't know. It just totally makes me uh, jazz. I also have a really cool um, uh, bookshelf yep. that is specifically devoted to uh, first editions of my favorite books. Cool. Um, or, you know, when I worked with an author, like when I went, with Scott, that's that he goes by Scott, by the way. It's yeah, Scott so cool Scott. on first first yeah. name basis, right? That's right. Well, that's how he knows that you know him is if you go Scott right. instead of Orson's. But anyways, so I snagged a first edition of Ender's Game. Like I had, oh. I, I had to pay a little bit for it, but then I brought it to Scott. I'm like, Scott, can you sign this to me? <laughs> he's like, and and here's the other thing too is he's like one of the best people. Um, yep. you tell you can tell that he absolutely loves his readers and he oh, cares so, cool. so much about what they have to say. And so anyways, um, I could gush about him, but I mean, same thing about Brandon Sanderson, so, wow, yeah. uh, Larry Nivens, like these right. guys are just incredible people. So it's uh, cool when they are great people too. And you find out you read their book, you love it. You find out they're awesome people and yep. they just love their, their readers. And cares. Malcolm Gladwell was another one that oh. I, I went to dinner with him and that guy oh. is, um, like I, sometimes like somebody who's that good at writing and that good of explaining and edu you know, and, and just, and then like, you're like, okay, he probably sits down, looks over his notes and then writes this good stuff. Now that guy is like naturally that way. Um, phenomenal. So it, it's, I, I say two things to this one. I love being in the industry of the products that I absolutely love most. You know, I love books yeah. and to be a part of that and see that and read it uh, has been incredible. And then the second thing is I've just found so many of the authors to be just phenomenal people. There's a lot of industries like from athletes to, uh, Hollywood or whatever. And yeah, you might not want to meet your heroes there, you know, but with writers, I feel like we've all been in the ditches together. We've all bled over our keyboards. And I don't think I would say a lot of people in our industry understand that. And they know what we're all going through. It's kind of like a, a to, to borrow the phrase from um from the military but like a band of brotherhood you know that's um, lovely we just know what we've that. been through so, <laughs> right that's what i think so freaking true that's awesome well thanks for sharing what you find most precious and what you love about it it's always fun hearing everyone's responses to that and everything so um where can people find out about you and kindle printer and atticus and rocket um, yeah. where can everyone find it? And I'll put it in the um, description of the video below too. So people can find you. Sounds good. Well, you can find me at uh, kindlepreneur.com out down at the bottom. There's a contact me page that you can click on, go there. Um, if there's any questions on anything I had to say, hit me up there. I'm still responding to all of those emails. So, um, Perfect. I'll see you there. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much, Dave. It was great talking to you. <laughs> Absolutely. And again, thanks for having me.